Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, get myself sorted out. Uh, it is good to be with you again. And uh, I'm really glad that things worked out better than expected. And I can actually see who I'm talking to and don't just have to look at a computer screen. Anyway, today I'm introducing a series on John's epistles. That's the letters 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But let's just pray to start off with. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for all the amazing wonder of creation and for all the things that you've done for us. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and learn from you this morning. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll help us to think about the way that you want us to live our lives and help us to see, Lord, how we can do that. So guide us and bless us as we read your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, my experience with um, 1 John is that whenever I read it, I'm challenged. I'm challenged to reconsider how I'm doing as a Christian. There are verses which focus on the issue of sin in your life. And there are sections which examine whether or not your life is really characterized by love. And I find myself asking, does the spiritual quality of my life measure up? Am I walking closely with the Lord each day? And another one, am I enjoying and prioritizing close fellowship with other believers? Okay. So a couple of months ago in the middle of winter, um, we went to a Sunday night service designed to help us identify with the experience of persecuted Christians in so many countries in the world today. So we met in the back room at church and we sat on the floor, which was carpeted in the dark, quietly, and using our torches, we read through John's gospel together, all 21 chapters, sharing our thoughts from time to time. And we took a cushion to sit on, but it was cold and it was uncomfortable and my 60 plus year old legs don't fold like they used to do. And it took nearly two hours, but it was fun. Uh, it was a fun thing to do and we enjoyed fellowship together. And when you read John's gospel, um, you notice it has a particular style of writing. This is John's gospel. It's different to Matthew or Mark or something you might read from one of Paul's letters, and you can tell it's John. Let me just read a section to you uh, and see if you can recognize this. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Okay, now did you realize that the first part that I read was from John's gospel, and then I slipped in some verses from 1 John. Um, but they sort of flow together because the language is very similar, and it would be even more obvious, I guess, if it was in the Greek, that the author was the same. One thing that's different about the epistles, uh, the letters though, is that John wrote them in his old age. And you might like to just picture in your mind an elderly man sitting at a desk and kind of pouring out his heart as he writes. Old people tend to repeat themselves. They sort of go over things again. And John does that in his letter. He repeats a few things and he amplifies them. He sort of emphasizes them a bit more as he goes along. And he jumps around from one theme to another. 
An unusual thing about the three letters is that the author doesn't let's just go back on that again. Okay. The author um, doesn't actually give his name in the letters, which leads to a bit of conjecture about who actually wrote them. But the thing that John emphasizes in these letters, or in First John especially, is the divinity of the Lord Jesus, that he truly was God. Okay, so just going over those ideas, um, the author is thought to be John, and most people believe that. The writing is similar in the gospel and in the letters. What's different is that John is writing in his old age. What's unusual is he doesn't name himself. And most importantly, it's all about the divinity of Jesus. But here's the thing. If you don't really know who the author was, how can you really be sure that what he says is true? Was Jesus really God? So the issue about the writing is a big issue. It's evidence that suggests that it really was John. And secondly, the recognized church leaders and prominent writers at the end of the first century and through the second century and into the third held the view that John the disciple was the author. And that's strong support as well. Now, going back to that um, previous, no, not that one. Here we go, that one there. When you picture John, not the guy on the left, no, probably using a scribe in a dark room, darkened room, maybe an oil lamp, and uh, spending a lot of time um, putting his thoughts on some serious issues into this letter. So let's read the first four verses of 1 John. Okay. So John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is a, a dramatic introduction. John confronts us with the historical reality and witness of the early apostles. We heard, we looked at, we touched. Jesus, the Holy One from God, who was eternally with the Father, but who was manifested in the flesh. Manifested is an old word that I think is in the, New, in the King James Version, and it means revealed, experienced, evidenced, and displayed. Do you ever wonder what it would have been like to be there and to hear and see and touch and enjoy being with Jesus. If you look at verse 1 again, it says, we proclaim. John wants to tell it out and let everybody know you can be sure we were there. And John MacArthur, who's a renowned Bible teacher, says the only way for us to establish and keep close fellowship, that is a meaningful and enduring relationship with other people, is by telling them, sharing with them, what we hold sacred and precious about the Lord Jesus Christ. So tell it out, share what you believe, drop it into the conversation, and you build lasting relationships. Verse 1 again, it says, This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And in verse 2, Halfway through, it says the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Jesus is the source and origin of real life, satisfying life, eternal life. On one occasion in his travels, Jesus got up. He headed off with his disciples through Samaria and uh, he got held up on the way at a drinking well. 
And while the disciples were away, he got into a conversation with a local woman. You know the story. As the conversation developed, she started to catch on to the fact that she was talking to someone very special. And to start with, the conversation revolved around the water in the well. Can I have a drink? How do you get the water? Whose water is it? And so on. And then in verse um, 13, this is in John's gospel, we read, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Fresh, invigorating, satisfying, empowering, cleansing water. And of course, water is a metaphor for life. So Jesus is the source and origin of real life, something that many people are searching for. Now, these words kind of remind us of another set of verses in John's Gospel, don't they? They link with the introduction in the beginning of the first chapter of John's Gospel. And if you've got your Bible there, you might like to just... Uh, find John's gospel. And we're just going to read three verses, verses one, two, and four. It says, in the beginning was the word, John chapter one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. In him, this is verse four, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Very similar in many ways to the first few verses in 1 John. And in both of these introductions, 1 John and, and um, John's Gospel, the Apostle is concentrating our focus on the identity of the one who came from heaven, bringing life and hope to the world. It's all about identity. And of course, identity is a really big thing in the modern world. Your ability to go places, to access information, or to engage in some kinds of activity, it seems non-stop, every day. You've got to provide identification. You've got to prove that you're the real thing. And when John called Jesus the Word, When John called Jesus the word in his gospel, he used the Greek term logos. And straight away, his readers understood what he was getting at because they were familiar with the Greek meaning of the logos concept. And in those times in the Greek world, it was a sort of term that held for a kind of creative force, a sort of ordering intelligent mind out there somewhere in the universe a kind of ethereal principle of reason or wisdom that caused everything to exist. But the Greek concept of the word was impersonal. It's just sort of a thing out there, an idea. And John takes the idea and he reveals that the design and creating cause of everything was actually a person. The word of God, the son of God, who was there in the beginning. In him was life itself. So the word is not an attribute of God or a message from God, but the word is God. That's the important thing. And when it says in verse 2, this is John's gospel, that he was with God in the beginning, the Greek is interesting. Apparently the Greek words used as proston theon, which implies that he was face to face with God in the beginning. And John tells us that the word was God. So as far as his identity goes, we can say three things. Here we go. The identity of Jesus. He is pre-existent regarding eternality. He's coexistent regarding his equality with God. And he's self-existent regarding the nature of his being. He's pre-existent to creation. He's co-existent with the Father. 
and he's self-existent in himself. He's not created. And uh, this is theology. And whenever you get theology, you've got to stop and just think, why is this important? So why is it important? Why is John emphasizing this so much? Well, it's important because John wrote the first letter partly to counter or to oppose a heresy, a completely wrong and dangerous idea that was starting to circulate around some of the churches in the Ephesus region where John was at the stage in his life. They were probably house churches. And um, it seems that some ideas have been put forward by some serious rebels in some of these churches. And John is seriously concerned about the effect of these ideas. And what they said was causing confusion. In fact, John calls these people antichrist. And if someone calls you antichrist, that's not good. Um, and in his second letter, Second John, he actually addresses this a bit more. He says in Second John verse 7, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. So it seems that these, these people were out and about sowing seeds of doubt among believers about the identity of Jesus, mainly that he was not divine. He was not the pre-existent creator. He was not the word that was with God in the beginning. Nor could he be the life and light of all mankind. So the result of that was that the troublemakers had been confronted and told to leave the church and now they were wandering around trying to find an audience and a following in other places. And John sees them as being dangerous. And there are some dangerous voices in theological institutions and in some churches today. People who advocate ideas that deny the true identity of the Lord Jesus. And as I said, the reason why John wrote the second letter, or partly the reason, is to warn one of the churches not to accept these people. Don't even welcome them. It's serious stuff. Have a look at verse 2 of chapter 1 again at the end. says we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the father and has appeared to us jesus appeared and became a hundred percent human being and that of course is what we call the incarnation that john's referring to jesus came into the world as a human being jesus who was pre-existent with god the eternal glorious son of God came and lived here on earth and he became one of us, a human being. In Philippians chapter 2, there's a section that um, you'll be familiar with, which emphasizes this. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And this is the bit that the enemies of Jesus oppose and reject in every age because the implications are enormous. If Jesus was only human, you can pick and choose what you like about his words. But if Jesus was and is truly God, creator and judge, you have to take notice of everything he said. And you need to believe and respond in obedience. So accepting the deity of Christ is a big step and a stumbling block for some non-Christians. 
And when Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, the implication for each of us is that we can't just do our own thing. We can't just do as we please. We can't make up our own truth because Jesus is God. Now, we know that, um, that John the disciple was, was one of the inner three disciples, um, James, John, and Peter, who spent more time with Jesus than anyone else. And Jesus shared some special moments with them. And we read about one of those occasions in Matthew chapter 17. So if you look at Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And uh, of course, the disciples were overwhelmed and didn't know what to do. And then a little bit later on in verse five, while he was still speaking, this is Peter who was speaking, a bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said this is my son whom i love with him i am well pleased listen to him the point is we must pay special attention to everything jesus said and we must put our faith and trust in him because we recognize who he really is the whole of Jesus' life story from birth to death to resurrection and ascension back to heaven substantiates his claim to be the divine son of God. We're going to go on back to 1 John and read the third verse. And it says, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The word used for fellowship is koinomia, and it has a meaning that suggests we have a personal experience of sharing something significant with somebody else, where we see eye to eye to them and we agree together. And if we have fellowship with God, we share his values and we love what he loves. We can only find out these things by reading the Bible. So here are five practical steps to fellowship with God. And I sort of shared some thoughts like this the last time I spoke, <clears throat> but they're really good from John MacArthur, I think. Number one, for fellowship with God, make and follow a serious plan to read the scriptures every day and more than once during the day. Select scripture passages that the Spirit impresses on you and mark them in your Bible and write them out so you can reflect on them and memorize them during the week. Talk to God about them. Number three, pray. Ask the Lord to help you internalize them. In other words, put them into action. Number four, when you get together with other Christians, share what you have discovered. And if you read about the, um, the underground church, when Christians get together in secret places like we were talking about before, one of the things they do that really makes things come alive is they share what they're discovering about Jesus as they're going on from day to day. What are you finding out? What's new? What have you experienced? And that's really a spark that keeps the Christian life going. And it's what we need to do in our growth groups too. And number five, Invite Jesus to be there with you in your work and conversations with non-Christians and keep your Christian perspective, fellowship with God. And then verse four, towards the end, the last verse we're going to look at this morning, we write this to make our joy complete. Walking in fellowship with God leads to joyous experience in your life. And there are many Psalms like Psalm 16 verse 11 that, um, that tell us about that joy and that, uh, that experience that David had. And uh, we know that joy is a big part of God's plan 
for our lives. And Jesus told a parable about joy, one of the short ones, one of the good ones, and one that we can all identify with. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. He was so excited. And um, John Piper says that when you see Jesus as your treasure, the spirit has blown through your heart. Your joy in Jesus is a gift. And uh, we know that joy is a fruit of the spirit, but it comes from having the right perspective. The man in the parable valued the treasure more than everything else he had. And it also comes from having the right attitude. And I was reading a little section in Daily Bread. Uh, this is actually in the 2019, but it's a little article entitled Playing with Joy. And it's written by uh, David Roper. And it says, one of our sons, Brian, is a high school basketball coach. One year as his team was dribbling its way through the Washington State Basketball Tournament, well-meaning folks around town asked, are you going to win it all this year? And they felt the pressure. Both players and coaches felt the pressure. So Brian adopted a motto, play with joy. He thought of Paul's last words to the elders at Ephesus, that I may finish my race with joy. Or as Brian, the coach says, may I play with joy. And they did win the championship that year. Joy is a fruit of the spirit of Jesus. So we must remember each morning to ask him to help us, may I play with joy. And that's a message that I need to internalize. And you probably do too. God promises us that we'll find joy in the journey as we follow him and exalt him in our lives and through our words and songs. And I just want to finish this morning by thinking about a door. So I want you to do something a bit different and I want you to imagine a door in front of you. It's not locked. You can easily push it open. And you're on the outside. On the outside, there's inner conflict and spiritual unrest. There's deception and there's domination by sin. It's a place where evil seems to be in charge. Ultimately, it's a place where you don't want to stay. On the other side of the door, you know, if you go through, there's meaning to life. On the other side, there's satisfaction, satisfaction and fellowship with God and with others. There's joy and there's harmony. There's peace because sins are forgiven and forgotten. And there's no condemnation there. There are many places in the scriptures where it says, come. God invites us all to come. God loves you so much that he repeats the invitation, come. And in John chapter 1 verse 12, which we read uh, earlier on in the gospel, it says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So if you've never responded properly to Jesus before, why don't you come today? Let's just close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray that uh, through the work of your Holy Spirit, you will enable us, Lord, to experience and walk in the life that you talk about here and in the joy of fellowship with other Christians. And we just pray that you help us, Lord, to stay close to you through the week in our work and wherever we are and to do what we can to build our fellowship with you and with others. 
And we just pray too, Lord, for anyone who has not experienced the life that you give, that they may come to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.